Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm asking listener questions to Lauren Sauer, the Director of Research at the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit and the Director of Operations with the Johns Hopkins Office of Critical Event Preparedness and Response. Let's listen. Thanks so much, Lauren, for joining me today. We're going to be answering questions from listeners of the podcast. Are you ready? Absolutely. Okay, here's the first one. What makes this upper respiratory infection, which is caused by an RNA virus, any different from 200 other upper respiratory infections that are caused by different RNA viruses? I think there's two key differences. The first is that it's causing severe disease. It's making people really sick. And that causes big strains on the healthcare system. It causes challenges at the individual level, and it can make people very sick or kill them. The other key difference is that we just don't know much about it compared to many of the other common RNA viruses that cause upper respiratory infections every day. Great. Here's a question. Our childhood immunization schedule has been put on hold, I think, Maybe not officially, but I think maybe unofficially, people are not bringing their kids in to the pediatrician. Is that going to be a concern? It's definitely going to be a concern. We worry about childhood immunizations anyway. And when hospitals are strained and we want to reduce the amount of time people spend in the healthcare setting or in the hospital or at clinics uh, because they're at risk to getting the disease, we want to make sure they're keeping as well as they can be otherwise. And childhood immunizations help with that and also help with a lifelong healthiness that, that we want to support and sustain. Great. Next question. I have read that prone body position helps very severely ill coronavirus patients in the intensive care unit. Is that true? We've seen reports that it is true and it can be helpful. Um, In fact, we have some proning studies going on at Johns Hopkins Hospital right now. The challenge with proning that we have to consider is that it is really staffing intensive. So you need a lot of staff to put people into the proning position and keep them that way um, and maintain their breathing and all the other things they need to do while they're proned. And it also is very PPE, personal protective equipment heavy. So um, you need a lot of PPE to do it safely. So we'll find out for sure when those studies come back. Absolutely. So um, that relates to another question that we got about studies. So people have heard about different kinds of studies. Why is everybody so focused on randomized controlled trials? Randomized controlled trials are how we learn. And it's really important in this setting because we don't know much about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV, the virus that causes COVID-19. So the randomized control design is how we identify medical countermeasures, medications, vaccines, all different kinds of things that are going to help us let me ask you. Be help. Yeah. Could you just explain what a randomized control trial is? Sure. A randomized control trial is a study design where a patient is randomized to either option one or option two, sometimes multiple options. And sometimes one of those options is a placebo. And that study design allows us to control for a lot of the other factors that may influence our ability to see the benefits and the risks associated with something like a treatment. So it helps figure out whether the treatment is really responsible for improvement or not. Right. Or harm. Or harm, because you can compare it directly with another treatment where everything else should be taken into account by the randomization. Absolutely. Yep. Got it. Okay. Next question. Coronavirus spreads by droplets. My assumption, this is the person who wrote the question, that's because there needs to be water for the virus to survive. But I've also read that coronaviruses survive best in dry conditions. What's going on there? So coronaviruses spread in droplets, and that's how we suggest the type of PPE that we use. The droplets 
contain the virus in them and they fall out of the air um, because they're too heavy to remain airborne. And that's the main difference between droplets and aerosol. So the virus particles are suspended in liquid, you know, when you cough or you speak or you exhale. And then those droplets, as they're falling out of the air, someone else may inhale them or get them into their mouth or their eyes. And that's why you have to be less than six feet away to really be at risk. Aerosol, the particles stay suspended a lot longer in the air. And so when they don't fall out because they're not as heavy, if you're just walking through a space where someone else was or you're, you can't maintain that distance, you could still be exposed. The water may evaporate. Particles that land on the surface may, the water may evaporate and then the particles desiccate and the virus dries. So they don't need to remain wet to stay infectious, um, but they do dry out and die. They dry out and then they eventually could become non-infectious. Yeah. But at a, for some period, they could be dry and infectious. For some period. And there's a lot of people working on how just how long SARS-CoV-2 remains infectious on all different surfaces and varying levels of dryness. Got it. Okay, next question. There are some reports that people have been reinfected. Does that mean we will not be able to get a vaccine? That's not exactly what it means. There are individuals who are going to get infected and not develop antibodies at all, but cellular immunity is pretty powerful, especially in the lungs. You almost always see antibodies, but sometimes they're weak and they just don't do anything. So in this case, I actually think my understanding is that there's not exactly studies showing people who have gotten very clinically ill twice, that maybe some people have become have been shedding virus a little bit later than expected, but we're still trying to understand whether people truly could be reinfected. Exactly. So we need a lot more research on a much bigger population to understand um, reinfection versus longer term viral shedding. And whether vaccines work is probably going to be up to some randomized controlled trials in the future. <laughs> Absolutely, it will. What is going to happen as there are fewer coronavirus infections to prevent coronavirus infected patients from infecting other patients in the hospital? So as we move back to more normal hospital operations and we have more and more non-coronavirus patients in the hospital, there's a couple of strategies that we take to protect the patients coming into the hospital, the healthcare workers, and the entire community from additional spread. We'll try to cohort the COVID-19 patients in specific locations so that um, we're not having the risk of COVID-19 patients being spread all over the hospital and potentially being on same units as non-COVID patients. We'll do some preliminary testing for people who come in for procedures and surgeries and make sure that they don't have coronavirus before they come in. And we'll try to cohort staff as well so that you're working either on a COVID unit or a non-COVID unit and keeping those sort of designations separate to protect everybody. Great. Um, one last question which is, is it possible to give someone a tattoo from six feet away? I think this relates to the opening of tattoo shops in Georgia this week. I certainly wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of a tattoo from six feet away, but I'm sure anything is possible. You need a long, long tattoo gun and a really steady hand. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much for taking time out to talk with me. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.